Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. This is Professor Abdesalam Yassin Taha from the College of Medicine, University of Suleimani, giving a talk on penetrating cardiac injuries. You can uh, find this lecture and others on my YouTube channel by clicking this website. Disclosure. The three cases presented in this lecture were previously published by the speaker in Basra Journal of Surgery in an article entitled Emergency Thoracotomy for Cardiac or Great Vessel Injuries, a report of five cases. This paper was published at 2005 and consisted of five cases Three of them are presented today. Penetrating cardiac trauma is a highly lethal injury, and those surviving to a hospital have an overall mortality approaching 80%. Reported mortality figures vary widely and are extremely dependent on mechanism of wounding cardiac chambers involved, and possibly the presence of cardiac tamponade. Despite significant advances in pre-hospital care, operative technique, and intensive care management, the mortality hasn't changed over several decades. Despite the deadly nature of this injury, reasonable survival can be achieved with a prompt diagnosis and surgical exposure, as well as adherence to the precise surgical principles. History of cardiac trauma management. The treatment of trauma to the heart has been written about since 3000 BC. Until the 19th century, the commonly held belief was that all penetrating cardiac trauma is fatal. However, the scenario changed in the 20th century as successful treatment of cardiac trauma began. The first successful cardiac repair was performed by Dr. Ludwig rain on September 9, 1896. And with the advent of cardiopulmonary bypass by Gibbon in 1953, repair of more complex injuries became possible. In 1885, Theodore Birroth stated that a surgeon who tries to suture heart wounds would lose the respect of his colleagues. So at that time, it was uh, an established belief that cardiac wounds are almost fatal, and therefore they believed that it, is, uh, it was not worthy uh, to try to suture such wounds. Similarly, Sir James Paget, in 1896, in his textbook, Surgery of the Chest, stated, surgery of the heart has probably reached the limits set by nature to all surgery. No new method or discovery can overcome the natural difficulties that attend a wound of the heart. Paradoxically, in the same year, in 1896, Dr. Ludwig Rain of Frankfurt, Germany, first successfully sutured a stab wound of the heart. It was a case of right ventricular wound, and he wrote, reporting the case, this proves the feasibility of cardiac suture repair without a doubt. I hope this will lead to more 
investigations regarding surgery of the heart. And this may save many lives. That was a quotation from Dr. Ludwig Rain. And the first reported repair of a cardiac wound in the United States was performed by brothers L. L. Hill and R. S. Hill in 1902. So a few years after the first procedure that was performed by Dr. Ludwig Rain, when they operated on a kitchen table in Alabama. For decades later, repair of a cardiac wound remained an isolated historic achievement. Certainly, stab wounds of the heart were common prior to 1896. But what held surgeons back? Perhaps it was the belief held by authorities since antiquity that cardiac wounds could not be healed. Ten years after his initial repair of a cardiac wound, Dr. Ludwig Rain accumulated a series of 124 cases with a mortality of only 60%, quite a feat or achievement at that time. Now, etiology and mechanism of wounding. Penetrating cardiac injuries can be produced by stabs, bullets, shrapnel, or some interventions such as placement of central venous catheters or pacemakers so-called iatrogenic injuries. A penetrating injury to the cardiac box is thought to be a predictive of an injury to the heart. What is the cardiac box? The cardiac box is defined as being bordered by the external notch superiorly, the xiphoid process inferiorly, and the nipples laterally. However, trauma to the upper abdomen, the back, and neck may be associated with cardiac injury as well. The cardiac chambers involved in penetrating cardiac injury. Most injuries are located in the right side of the heart. So, the right atrium, 14%, right ventricle, involved in 43%, while on the left side, the left ventricle is involved in 33%, and the left atrium in 5% of cases only. Additionally, coronary arteries are involved in 3.1 to 4.4% of cases. Cardiac fistulas, uncommon but dramatic complication of penetrating cardiac injury, can occur between coronary arteries or aorta and cardiac chambers. Now, what is the role of pericardiocentesis in the treatment of penetrating cardiac injuries? As we said, cardiac tamponade may be a presentation of penetrating cardiac injuries. So what is the role of pericardiocentesis in the management of traumatic uh, cardiac tamponade or hemopericardium. The first successful pericardiocentesis for cardiac wound was accomplished by Larry, the surgeon to Napoleon. In the 20th century, pericardiocentesis was replaced by emergency operative intervention for cardiac wounds. There are few studies that recommend pericardiocentesis in the setting of a penetrating cardiac injuries. Jones et al. report a case series where emergency room pericardial drainage for penetrating cardiac injuries had acceptably low mortality rates when used as a bridge to definitive surgery. 
So precardiosynthesis for cardiac trauma should be performed in the operating room with facilities for immediate exploration available, and it can be considered as a bridge for definitive surgery. Repair of cardiac wound or cardiography can be done in different ways, and there are some important practical tips. To uh, control the hemorrhage, and once a laceration in the heart is isolated, temporary hemostasis can be achieved with a finger. Okay, so you can see a finger controlling the wound while suturing is performed or with a Foley's catheter. Similarly, a Foley's catheter can be used to stop the bleeding while suturing of the wound is performed. And Satinsky vascular clamp can be used for atrial lacerations, like in this picture. A vascular clamp is applied while suturing of the atrial wound is performed. The traditional method for repair of the laceration is to use sutures with pledges, like in this picture. Sutures are buttressed with pieces of dacron so that the suture doesn't cut through the myocardial wound. However, surgical staples may be faster and safer. Here you can see a, staple, a stapler is used to close the uh, cardiac wound. Uh, sometimes the laceration is near a coronary artery. So if uh, the laceration is near a coronary artery, the suture is passed beneath the coronary artery to avoid its damage. This is a very uh, important uh, practical uh, tip to avoid damaging a coronary artery. Here in in this lecture, three cases of penetrating cardiac injuries are presented. All were admitted and managed successfully in the section of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery Suleimani at Teaching Hospital in one year period. The management is outlined with literature review. The first case was a 35 year old man brought to the emergency department on 25th of September, 2004, three hours after being stabbed. There were two stab wounds. The first one was in the left fourth intercostal space, just to the left of the sternum, while the second wound was in the lateral aspect of the left upper arm. The patient was conscious, but extremely pale and shocked. Profuse bleeding occurred from the chest wound on leaning forward. The pulse rate was rapid and feeble. Blood pressure was low, 80 over 60 millimeter of mercury. Heart sounds were inaudible. Chest auscultation revealed good air entry bilaterally. The neck was swollen and the veins were distended. So the clinical picture was uh, a, a, a picture of uh, hemorrhagic shock along with cardiac tamponade. X-ray of the chest showed a normal sized heart with no evidence of hemo or pneumothorax. The features were highly suggestive of cardiac injury and tamponade. Regarding the upper arm injury, the bleeding was controlled by a tight dressing. The limb was swollen, tense and cold. Peripheral pulses were absent. Therefore, brachial artery injury was highly suspected. The patient was taken urgently to the operating room. Medial sternotomy was performed. Extra 
pericardial fat was hematomized. Once the pericardium was incised, clots were evacuated. Profuse bleeding occurred. A wound was felt in the right ventricle and sealed temporarily by a digit. A vascular clamp was applied to the site of the injury. Blood and IV fluid were rapidly infused. The wound was then sutured by interrupted two or silk sutures buttressed by pieces of dark brown patch. The clamp was then released. Bleeding from the ventricular wound has completely ceased. So this is an operative picture of the patient after completion of repair of the cardiac wound. As you can see, the pericardium is open. The extra pericardial uh, fat is hematomized. That is the wound in the right ventricle, which has been sutured by interrupted two or six sutures uh, on Dacron uh, legits. Additionally, lacerated left internal memory artery was also bleeding profusely. To get a control of it, the left floor space was entered, the lima pedicle was ligated, a tube drain was left in the pericardial sac, the pericardial eggs were approximated by interrupted two or silk sutures, a tube drain was also placed in the left pleural uh, cavity, and the wound was then closed in the routine way. And this is an operative video of the uh, patient at the uh, time of uh, completion of the repair. Then the left upper arm wound was then explored. Fasciotomy of forearm uh, was performed immediately. The tissues were still viable. The Baker artery was found completely transected, while the nerves were partially injured. The artery was repaired by end-to-end -end anastomosis, and the wound was then partially closed. So immediate fasciotomy was performed, revealing viable muscles of the forearm. And then the injury was explored in the left uh, upper arm, and the breaker artery was completely transected. You can see vascular clamps on the proximal and distal arterial segments, while the nearby nerves were partially injured. Repair of the break, breaker artery was performed in the standard way. You can see here the proximal and distal end of the artery. And then the anastomosis uh, is started using uh, 6O polypropylene suture. And here you can see the uh, repair has been completed and we are feeling the pulse distal to the anastomosis and the repair is completed. The post-operative course was uneventful. The drains were removed in 48 hours. Post-operative hemodynamic state was stable. 
uh, the chest x-ray as you can see was normal additionally the post operative ECG was normal showing no evidence of myocardial ischemia and the patient uh, was discharged home on the 10th post operative day you can see the wound the stab wound in the chest in the left fourth intercostal space and that is the second stab wound in the upper arm and the uh, wound in the left upper arm was partially closed the fasciotomy wound was uh, closed after 10 days so in conclusion that was a case of right ventricular wound plus lima transection plus brachial artery injury managed uh, successfully the second case was an 18 year old child arrived to our hospital at 29th October 2004 almost one month after the first case with a stab wound on his anterior chest that was the site of the stab wound the wound was in the left second intercostal space between the edge of the sternum and mid clavicular line about one inch in length the wound was about one inch in length the patient was pale dystic and shocked left side the chest tube drained about 1800 ml of blood with uh, continuous loss heart sounds were faint but the neck veins were not distended x-ray of the chest revealed left-sided radio-opaque hemithorax the patient was resuscitated by transfusion of five units of blood but in spite of that shock persisted lima and or intercostal artery were suspected to be injured beside possible cardiac injury urgent left thoracotomy was performed the thoracic cavity was full with arterial blood and clots rapid evacuation of blood and clots was done arterial bleeding was observed from lima transection besides profuse venous bleeding from a hole in the pericardium the pericardium was incised obliquely anterior to the left phrenic nerve pericardial stay sutures were placed a tear about two centimeters in length was seen at the origin of the pulmonary trunk with no bleeding probably due to hypotension the tear was sutured by continuous 2 or silk the lacerated lima was ligated by silk hemostasis was secured the edges of the pericardium were approximated by interrupted 2 or silk sutures two chest tubes were placed the chest was closed in layers the patient recovered from anesthesia slowly he was given adequate intravenous fluid and 200 ml of 20 percent mannitol until good urine output was obtained the chest tubes drain nothing for a few hours uh, post-operatively so that is the operative uh, picture you can see the uh, wound at the origin of the pulmonary trunk which was sutured by a continuous uh, two or silk suture and you can see a hole in the pericardium produced by the stab wound and that is uh, an operative video of the case after the completion of the repair
here we are pointing to the uh, uh, site of Lima transection near the sternum. Next day, the patient was conscious but still pale. The basal chest tube drained 1,800 ml of blood. Therefore, a decision was done to re-explore the patient urgently. When re-explored, the chest was full with liquid blood without clots. The site of pulmonary trunk and lima repair were inspected. No surgical bleeder was found, but a continuous capillary ooze. Bleeding diathesis due to massive transfusion was suspected. Thus, the patient was transfused with fresh blood and given vitamin K and cyclocapron inje injections. And after tedious hemostasis, the chest was closed in layers. And this is the uh, photograph of the patient. You can see the site of the stab wound anteriorly. And you can see the left postro-lateral uh, thoracotomy and the two uh, chest tubes. Next day, the drainage decreased to 700 ml of diluted red blood, and just x-ray showed full expansion of both lungs. But to our surprise, and in the post-operative period, the patient was discovered to have a systolic murmur all over the precordium. Echocardiography was performed and revealed a small post-traumatic ventricular septal defect. So the stab wound has penetrated the pulmonary trunk and has injured the septum between the two ventricles. The patient was discharged home on 10th post-operative day in a good health and follow-up was advised and this is the color Doppler of the patient revealing the post-traumatic uh, VSD. So the patient, uh, in conclusion, has a pulmonary trunk injury plus Lima transection plus post-traumatic VSD. That is the interventricular septum and you can see a small hole in the ventricular septum through which there was a flow of blood from the left ventricle to the right ventricle proved by color Doppler. Very interesting case. That's the third case, and of course, as you know, if the time is not enough, please we can uh, sign again to complete the lecture. That was a 16-year-old girl who had been brought to the hospital on the 7th of January 2005 with a stab wound to her left anterior chest. She arrived to the hospital one hour after the injury and she was extremely pale and dystonic. Air entry was absent on the left side. 
axillary of the chest revealed totally radio opaque left hemithorax with a shift of mediastina to the right side. Chest tube was placed and drained 1,200 ml uh, of blood immediately. The drainage continued and reached 2,500 ml of blood within two hours. And she was brought to the operation room uh, urgently almost one hour after hospitalization. She was in a gasping state. Left postlateral thoracotomy was performed in minutes. The chest was full with clots and the blood. The precardium was distended with the blood and there was a wound in the anterior chest wall and pericardium with active bleeding through the pericardial wound. The clots were evacuated quickly. The pericardial wound was extended parallel to the phrenic nerve. Clots were removed from inside of the pericardium. A wound was found in the right ventricle near the atrioventricular junction with profuse bleeding. The bleeding was temporarily sealed by a digit. A vascular clamp was applied. The tear was then sutured by interrupted one silk sutures. Hemostasis was secured. Two chest tubes were placed. The chest wall was closed in layers. The patient had recovered from anesthesia smoothly and the post-operative course was smooth. X-ray of the chest post-operatively revealed full expansion of the left lung. But the ECG showed an ST elevation followed by a Q wave and T inversion in V2 to V6, V3 and AVF leads. So if, as you can see here, there was an ST elevation in V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, as well as V3 and AVF. IVF. These were features of acute infralateral myocardial infarction. In spite of that, she was discharged well on the 10th post-operative day. ECHO showed epical hypokinesia. Apart from the ECG and ECHO findings, the patient was doing well on follow-up visits. So in conclusion, that patient had a right ventricular wound plus suspicion of coronary artery injury. So, the discussion. The incidence of penetrating cardiac injuries appears to be rising, presumably because of an increase in civilian violence. The right ventricle, which consumes most of the anterior portion of the heart, is the cardiac chamber most frequently injured. In our cases, the right ventricle and lima were injured twice, while the pulmonary trunk and ventricular septum were injured once. In the second case, VSD was suspected postoperatively due to cardiac murmur and then proved by echocardiography. On the other hand, coronary artery injury was suspected on the basis of postoperative EC changes. Hence, neither the VSD nor the coronary artery injury were suspected at the time of surgery. The exact cause of coronary artery injury was not clear. It could be related to either the trauma itself or the repair procedure. Even if the VSD and coronary artery injury were discovered at time of surgery, no facility of cardiopulmonary bypass was available to deal with such complications. The priority was, of course, to just save the patient's lives. The second patient refused definitive elective closure of the VSD. And despite suspicion of coronary artery injury in the third case, the patient did well for a while. 
married and became pregnant. Coronary article and geography was recommended a few years later as she developed recurrent chest pain. The two life-threatening problems after cardiac trauma are tamponade and hemorrhage. Tamponade develops rapidly as the normal pericardium can accommodate only 100 to 250 ml of blood. Small wounds such as those from a knife often produce tamponade because the laceration in the pericardium is small. Larger wounds produced by bullets or uh, larger knives threaten immediate death from exaggerations as blood can be expelled through the pericardial laceration into the pleural cavity. Generally speaking, tamponade carries a better prognosis than frank hemorrhage. A mediastinotomy is the preferred incision as it provides ready access to all chambers of the heart. So the take home messages of our lecture today, of today, the patient with penetrating cardiac injury should be taken to the operation room as quickly as possible. As stated by Kirkland and Barrett boys, no more than five minutes need elapse between admission and the patient's transfer to the operating table. Although the three patients reported herein were treated with limited facilities as our unit was at its beginning. Rapid transport of the patients to operating room and urgent surgery were essential to save. Okay, and this is the uh, list uh, of papers uh, used in uh, preparing our lecture. And uh, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy the lecture. This is Professor Abdesalam Yassin Taha from the College of Medicine, University of Suleimani, signing off. Thank you, sir.